and so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak when the man saw that he could not overpower him he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man then the man said let me go for it is daybreak but Jacob replied I will not let you go unless you bless me the man asked him what is your name look at your neighbor and say what is your name Jacob he answered then the man said your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome Jacob said please tell me your name I mean who is this tell me your name but he replied why do you ask my name then he blessed him there Amen. I want you to take on this, this, this declaration, this affirmation this morning and put your hand on your chest and say, I am becoming. I am becoming. I am. Come on, look to your neighbor to the left and the right of you and say, I am. I am becoming. I am becoming. You, you may be seated. I feel like y'all musicians, y'all. I think we're going to preach. Hey, God, hallelujah. I am becoming. I am becoming. I have come to the awareness that one of my God-given assignments on this earth is to, one, dispel the lies of the enemy and to declare the truth through the word of God. Amen. It would seem that every time that I have an opportunity to minister and even amongst mentoring and not mentoring, but yeah, counseling and sharing with friends that I'm always talking about the wiles of the enemy because the scripture says that we are not ignorant concerning Satan's devices. Amen. So since the beginning of time, Satan has attempted to rapidly progress his agenda because he knows that his time is running short. Therefore, he works day and night to create enmity and a wedge of division between God and man. He does this by affecting our vision. Hallelujah. How many say, somebody say vision. Our vision on how God, how we see God and how we see ourselves. The fact is that Satan has an abundance of faith in God. He believes what the scripture says concerning you. Come on, if you don't believe in Satan, he knows the plans that God has for you. And guess what? Whether you believe it or not, he does. He does. Hallelujah. Therefore, his plot is to affect our perception. He wants us to doubt God and his word. Hallelujah. John, in the book of John, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the what? The light, amen. Satan will attempt to drown out that light by imputing darkness through sin and attempt to inject lies by concealing the truth. And who is that truth? It's Jesus. And so it's not uncommon to attend church faithfully, Sunday church, Wednesday church, and still have doubts about God. Come on, I know I'm not by myself. Struggling with your faith struggling with the things you believe struggling the prophetic voice that's been spoken over you hallelujah but I, I, but I'm convinced that there is more hallelujah to this thing I, something inside of me speaks to me and says even though I have doubts I still believe this thing hallelujah how many out there you still believe this thing there's a part of me there's this two-sided of me I, I know the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways but there is something in me that says I've got to believe this thing I've got to believe this thing I believe that there's more to God that I haven't even scratched the surface to amen David found himself self in a place of desolation he had lost his son his his son that he had prayed for he was in a place of grief and loss that overwhelmed him anybody ever been there I've been there amen and he was at this place but he declared within himself I would have fainted hallelujah let's that I, I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living I would have given up a long time ago unless I had believed that there was something more to this journey there was something more to this walk with Christ I would have faint I would have given up 
Hallelujah. But I believe there's more. Look at your neighbor and say, there's more. Oh, there's more. There's more. And I just don't want to walk this journey. I don't want to walk this journey of Christ neglecting the access that I have through his Holy Spirit. I don't want to neglect it. Amen. I don't want to have the look of church. Come on. The look of church. The shout of church. The chants of church. The O's of church. We got plenty of O's in this season. Amen. I don't want to have the look of church, but denying the authority and the power that I have as a believer. Come on now. Hallelujah. There's authority that we have when we are believers. Hallelujah. There's access that we have when we are believers. But what happens is we don't take hold of it. Why? Because a lot of times we lack faith, not just in God, but in who we are. God, not in me, not in me. So I want to ask you, how do we get to, to this place of lacking faith? And so if you're taking notes or if you're mentally taking a note, I want you to write this down. We arrive here when we start measuring God with the same measuring stick that we use to measure ourselves and the people around us. It's a mouthful. I'll say it again. We arrive here when we start measuring God with the same measuring stick that we use to measure ourselves. Okay, my failures, my flaws. Oh, God, he's probably, that's, that's how he's going to be. And the people around us. So what do you mean, Elder Brittany? We allow our expectations with people and our experiences with people shape our understanding of God. Amen. So when I was in college, I studied psychology. And um, while I was studying the human behavior, one of the first lessons that I was taught is how humans understand the world around us. And so the mind is beautiful. And I learned that the brain uses a function called association. Association. Simply put, our brains are associating machines, and we associate things with each other so that we can learn about the world around us. So what does this mean? So we begin to struggle with our faith in God when we associate God with a father who abandoned us. When we associate God with the experiences that we've had with friends. Amen. And so unknowingly, we develop this perception of God's character. And so somewhere in my mind, I made God to be synonymous with people in my life that were unfaithful. Therefore, I start believing that maybe God is unfaithful. Come on. Come on, we're going to talk about some deep things. How can I trust a God that I can't see? How can I trust a God that I can't feel? How can I trust a God that promised that things would happen and I don't see it coming to pass? So my limited brain begins to tell me that God's plans aren't good. At least his plans aren't good for me. And we start to view God based on our own imperfections. How can a God forgive somebody like me? Because if I did what I did to God, I wouldn't forgive me. I wouldn't use me. I wouldn't call me to do nothing in church. Not mop the floor. Not wipe the walls. Not do nothing. Not be on that camera. Not preach this gospel. Because I know me. I know my flaws. I know my down sitting. I know my uprising. I know the things that I have challenges with. I know the prayers that I continue to pray for me. Lord, deliver me. And then he still chooses to use me. He still chooses to call me his own. He still chooses to call me God select. He still chooses to call me his, his love and his beloved. And so I am conflicted. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted because this thing, you know, I trust God. Hallelujah. But I'm so glad that God's not like man. I'm so glad that God looked beyond my faults and he saw that I was in need of a savior. He looked beyond my mess and knew that I had a message. He looked beyond my tests and the trials that I experienced and knew that I had a testimony. Hallelujah. Looked at somebody and say, I am becoming. I am becoming. And how many know it took that? It took the 
those situations. It took you having to trust God in a new way. It took you having to trust God when you didn't see him. It took, it took all those experiences. So the Bible says that, that Satan, we're going to talk about him a little bit. Satan is the father of lies. 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 <laughs> and the truth is not in him. He is fully aware that when we have an encounter with the truth, and that's in Jesus, it will become free. Free from that mindset and battling back and forth. That two-sided mind, that double-minded man will come with the truth of God. And so before the foundations of, of, of the well, not the foundations of work, because he made the world, but before we were even um, thought of, that there was always controversy, controversy about the identity of Jesus. Amen? And some call him a teacher. Some call him a, 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 a prophet. And, but, every, but the truth is that many people even reject him altogether as Jesus, his existence. But I love it that when Jesus, he had a moment and he had a, he had a conversation with the disciples. He says, who do men say that I am? And he knew who he was, but he wanted to understand their perception of him. What, how am I perceived? How am I perceived? And, and they responded and says, um, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias. Some others say you're Jeremiah. And others say that you're one of the prophets. But Peter had a revelation. Peter had a re re revelation about the true identity of God. He said, thou art the Christ the son of God. And I want to speak prophetically to this house that God wants you to have a personal experience and revelation about the identity of God. Everything that I have experienced in my life speaks to the character of God. I've gone through sickness and I can now call him a healer. I've experienced grief and loss and I can call him a comforter. I've experienced being judged and lied on. I can call him my advocate. Amen. I've doubted the call of God on my life, and I can experience his faithfulness towards me. And even there's some times that I've been left alone, and I call him my friend. God wants to reveal himself to you, but can you see beyond your circumstances? Can you see beyond who, who, who you are? Q, can you see beyond who I am today and allow God to reveal himself and who you are in the future can you stay in this thing long enough to see the revealing can you stay in this thing long enough to see yourself becoming 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 when I was preparing for this message um, I just heard the word becoming and a lot of times you know when ministers we speak before people it hits us first it, it, it hits us all the way first. And, you know, and the first thing I was considering is like, ah, my confidence. Can I do this thing? But I decided to do something different. I was sharing this with Pastor Kasha. I decided to do something different this time. Typically, I would have got nervous. And not saying nerves, nervous is a bad thing. But I'm telling you, I get really, really nervous. Like really, and almost crippling, crippling nerves and fear. And I said, I want to do something different this time. I'm going to activate faith. If, if, if God says that I have this access through faith, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, I'm going to activate this. I'm going to try this thing out this time. I'm going to try this thing out this time. So we're going to do that. We're going to activate our faith. We're going to activate our potential and move in it and walk in it, and we're going to become. Amen? How many believe that? So say it again. I am becoming. De uh, becoming is defined as the process of coming to be something. Becoming is an indication that something or someone is in an active process of arriving at a place of potential. Potential. Having uh, the capacity to develop into something in the future. Becoming. Becoming. So let's talk about our character um, in our scripture text, Jacob. So Jacob was at a place of fear and desperation. Are you desperate yet? We talked about, isn't it something the praise sings, the Britney sung that song, that I want to be where you are. Are you desperate? I'm desperate for you. So De Jacob was at this place of desperation. 
He had been on the run. Anybody know the story about Jacob? He was on the run. He deceived his, brother, his twin brother Esau. Yes. So at this moment, he's on the run, and God has told him to go back. Go back home. Not the home where I had this issue at, right? So it's been 20 years, and so Jacob has left to go back to deal with the issues of his past. So Jacob, the truth is, Esau, his brother, hated him. And the scripture says that Jacob, that Esau had made a vow that if he saw Jacob, he was going to kill him on sight. Somebody say on sight. I learned that from the young people, on sight. Oh, my gosh. So after 20 years of being away from home, God spoke him to return. And I wanted to say this, that sometimes in our becoming, we're going to have to face things regarding our past. I know you think just because you hadn't talked about it in a while that you're over it. I know that you think that just because there's no static and they're not making any um, subliminal Facebook posts that you're cool. Now, but some of us need to go back and deal with some issues from our past. So you're trying to understand yourself. You're trying to become, but without resolving some issues that you dealt with in your past. In Jacob's case, he was one who had caused offense, but he had to return home to make things right. But before his journey back home, Jacob needed to have some alone time with God. Some alone time with God. He needed to have some encounter with Jesus. He needed to get into the presence of God. And I can imagine having this, this weight and worry on my, on my back that I got to go and deal with this thing that I hadn't, hadn't dealt with in over 20 years. And God, I need strategy. I need, I need favor. I need strategy. I don't know what's going to happen. And so Jacob had, had concocted this whole strategy of how he was going to meet his, his brother and try to check out and see if things were okay. So he sent his servant before him, and it said, his servant was like, um, um, uh, Esau has about 400 men that's coming with him, and he's on his way to see you too. Okay, so he's nervous. He's stressed out. And, oh, wait a minute, period. He's stressed out. <laughs> He's stressed out. And so he, he, he takes this moment in realizing that I'm at a place I need God. Yeah. And so we know the story of Jacob that he was a deceiver. The Bible refers to his weakness. Isn't that something? Yeah. We hear about his weakness, him being a deceiver. But I want to say, listen this to you, that, that Jacob is not unlike many of us. And what I mean by that, Jacob was a fixer. Jacob was a fixer. He had a problem. He had issues. He had an issue with his birthright. He was worried about this situation, so he wanted to fix it. How many of y'all help God out a lot? Help him out. I, Lord, I don't know if you're going to do it, so let me help you out. I don't know if God's going to show up for me to pay this bill, so let me take out this loan. I want to help God out. I don't know if he's going to give me a husband that's saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to get this brother in the street. I'm going to help God out. <sighs> Abraham, I don't know whether or not, you know, I can have a child at a young age, at this old age. So I'm going to help him sleep with my, my concubine, Hagar. I'm going to help God out. We help God out a whole lot. But Jacob realized I can't help I can't help myself in this situation. I have no strategy. I have no plan. I don't know how to fix this. I need to get in the presence of God. I need to get in the presence of God. And so there will come times in your walk with God that you need to hear from God, but you'll have to embrace, embrace being alone with God. Embrace that sometimes you can't go to your friends and family. You have to hear a word from God. Look at your neighbor and say, I need a word from God. Ooh, I need a word from God. This situation is too much for me. I need a word from you, God. Amen. He'll cause the things around you. He'll cause um, situations with family members to cause you to be dependent on God. Ah, hallelujah. I, realized, I didn't realize that you guys had just coming back to church a month ago. And so in, this, in the onset of this pandemic, we found ourselves alone. The stay-at-home orders gave us opportunities to become face-to-face -face with ourselves. And we didn't have to be outside running errands and 
football game. I don't know about y'all. I was over it. Football practice, cheerleading practice, Bible study, board meetings. I was over it. And uh, but I but I wanted to go to church still though. But the church was closed down. So therefore, I was left alone, and left alone with my relationship with God. Amen. So, but he longs for a space to be intimate with you. And some of you guys are looking at your, who you are and thinking, God don't want to talk to me. He's not interested in having a relationship with me, but he wants to, he, he wants to have intimate relationship with you. He longs to introduce you to a part of yourself that can be revealed only through relationship and being alone with God. So on your road to becoming how desperate are you? I'm telling you, we're in the message. How desperate are you for the more of God? Amen. The more of God. So let's go on to, I want to say this. Sometimes pain is a part of becoming. Sometimes pain is a part of becoming. And so just at the moment when Jacob was about to overpower God, the Bible says that God touched him at the socket of his hip. The Bible says that he was left afflicted. He was left with a limp. The bone of his hip was separated from the tendon. And no doubt Jacob was experiencing pain. But sometimes affliction can cause you to fight harder. I don't know about you. I'm not an easy win. You might beat me, but I'm not an easy win. I'm a, I'm a fighter. How many of your fighters in here? I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. So, and, and so everything around him was speaking of the pain that he was experiencing, but he was determined to receive something from God. Hallelujah. I believe that, um, that the touch, that, that God could have touched him anywhere. He could have touched him anywhere. But in um, Hebrew culture, when someone was making an agreement or a promise with someone, they would put their hand under the thigh. Right. And the, that symbolized covenant right. and promise. So, so, so I believe that Jesus, the God, Jesus, same thing, um, he knew that he was making a covenant with Jacob in that situation. Hallelujah. So sometimes that the God would touch you in an intimate place. An intimate place so that you can have covenant and relationship and a connection with God. But see, but this, but this touch gave him a limp. So a touch with God sometimes will leave you with a limp for an outward testimony of the intimate encounter and the covenant with God. Hallelujah. I may have some scars, but they're testifying that I'm healed. Come on, right? I may have some, some issues. I may have this ways, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking and I'm exemplifying the testimony that God healed me. God delivered me. God set me free. And that's why it's important for us to share our story and our becoming. Hallelujah. Because there's redemption in your story. And although I see your limp, I want to know your story. So I want to see your story. Hallelujah. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 um, through 18, it says, For which cause we faint not, but through our outward man, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say, it's working for me. It's working for me. I want to jump down to verse 27. And where, where, God, where God asks Jacob, what's his name? God knows where you are in your journey of becoming. And he is fully aware of your future triumphs and your failures. And he still chooses you. Satan does not want you to see yourself how God sees you. Therefore, he will allow us to believe the labels that were placed on us from birth. From the moment that we were conceived, there was an immediate expectation on who we would become. If we ask most parents, they desire for their child to be successful, and they had expectations or hopes pertaining to their character. They wanted them to be a doctor, a lawyer, or what? Engineer, amen, amen. So, um, so a child, we, nobody expects for the child to grow up in society, hallelujah, with the, uh, being a burden in society or being a statistics. So from the conception, they consider a name. They consider a name for a boy or girl. But I want to say this, the name, what does Jacob's name mean? What does Jacob's name mean? Jacob's name meant supplanter. 
It meant one who was wrongfully seized as our holds the place of another. He was living up to the name that was given to him. But God, but God realized that his name was lying on him. Your family name may have some indications about who you should be, but it's lying on you. Hallelujah. It was, he was living up to that name, so he became the liar. He became the cheater, and he stole his brother's birthright, but God had a name change for him. Amen. He said it. He said in verse 20, he said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. So what does the name Israel mean? It means triumphant with God. God, it, Jacob knew that if he got a connection with the true one, the holy one, that he would have triumphant victory. So I want you to tell your neighbor, God is changing my name. So we listen to the scriptures and it calls, they, he, they still call him Jacob, but it was important that Jacob understood what was taking place. Hallelujah. So on your journey of becoming, you will have to embrace what God is saying about you. I may have struggles in my faith, but I am taking on the identity of God. He calls me blessed. He calls me triumphant. He calls me whole. Hallelujah. Jacob was no longer reliant on his ability, but he was now victorious and triumphant with God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, my name is changing and I am becoming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to, this is my last point I want to bring about is that Jacob said, please tell me your name. And he asked, why do you want to know my name? And then, he, then the, is, it, there's no conversation after that, but the scripture says he blessed him there. There was no conversation. What's your name? My name is Jacob. He blessed them there. What is your name? My name is Jacob. He blessed them there. Hallelujah. Jacob held on to God, fighting God and demanded a blessing. But it wasn't until Jacob sought to develop a deeper understanding of God. What is your name? Hallelujah. That he gained access to the blessing. So what are the scriptures telling us here? That some of us are seeking tangible blessings from God. If you want a financial blessing, you want to be blessed in your, in your home with cars, but he wants to introduce you to the blesser. Hallelujah. The, the, the um, Samaritan woman was at the well, and the Bible says that she had an encounter with Jesus. Hallelujah. She desired a drink of water, but he gave her water that would be springing up into everlasting life. He wanted to give her something more. He wanted to present to her who he was. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to minister to someone who is discouraged about your present place. Hallelujah. Stay with God. Hallelujah. I know that God is bringing you into your rightful place. Come on. Stay with God. I know it feels hard what you're going through, but stay with God. I know that you're having challenges in your life, and I don't trust what God is doing, but stay with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, because how many know that you are becoming? I'm so glad that God has a purpose for me and that I'm becoming. Hallelujah. Come here, Moses, and tell your testimony. I was a murderer before God made me a deliverer. Come here, Abraham. I was a liar before God made me the man of faith. Hallelujah. Come here, Rahab, who was a prostitute before she was in the lineage of Jesus. David, he was an adulterer, a murderer, and a thief. And he became known as a man after God's own heart. I am becoming. I don't care what it looks like. I'm becoming Saul. He persecuted the church and became Paul who preached Jesus. Peter denied Jesus but stood up on the day of Pentecost and over 3,000 people were saved. Somebody shout, I am becoming. Tell your neighbor, it's more to me than what you see. I'm becoming. Hallelujah. I'm more than my mistakes. I'm more than my family name. I am becoming. I may not look like much, but God is working something in me. It may not be, hallelujah, what you expect for me to be, but I believe, hallelujah, that eyes haven't seen, neither has ears heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And it shall, hallelujah, 
and it does not appear what we shall be. Hallelujah. But when he comes, we shall be like him. I am becoming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not that I have already attained. Hallelujah. But this one thing that I do, somebody say, I press. I press towards the call, the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. I am becoming. Hallelujah. I believe. Come on, put your hand in your chest. Says, I believe what God says about me. I'm moving out of faith. I'm moving out of fear. And I'm stepping into faith. Let's say it again. I'm moving out of fear. And I'm stepping into place, into faith. Because this is my coming out season. I'm beginning to walk in my destiny. I am triumphing with God. Hallelujah. Why am I triumphing with God? Because I had an encounter with Jesus. Hallelujah. The one who can change my name. The one who holds my future. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. God is all in the middle in every situation, in every trial, every setback, he's in it. Every situation, he's in it. Even though you feel like you failed, even though you feel like you, you run out of time, God says, I am time. I am limitless in my ability. And hallelujah, and he that have begun a good work in you shall perform it. Hallelujah. He shall perform it to the day of Jesus Christ's return. I am becoming. Come on and lift up your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 I will choose to believe what the word of God says over me. Hallelujah. I am blessed. Hallelujah. In the city. I am blessed in the field. I'm blessed in my going out and my coming in. The hand of God is over me. He calls me his beloved. He calls me his own. I am anointed. I am a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm becoming, hallelujah. I am moving into my place of destiny. I am moving, hallelujah, to my place of faith. I am moving to be an overcomer. I am moving into my place. Hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God. I start my doubts and I su supply my faith. I believe God. I believe God. When the enemy speaks, when he speaks doubt inside of me, I will not be wavered in my faith, but I will trust and I will believe God. I will stand on his promises. Every prophecy is yea. Is a yay, is a yay, and amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh God, am I Hallelujah. God wants to recharge you this morning. Hallelujah. You've been locked inside, and hallelujah, you've been played with your own mind. Now, some of us have been playing with our own mind. We look at where we are today, and we have no idea how we're going to get to where God has called us to go. We have no idea. And that's the challenge of sometimes being prophetic. I see where I am now, and I see where God has called me to be, but I have no idea how I'm going to get there. It doesn't look favorable for me. I'm full of doubt. How is it going to happen? Hallelujah. But I believe, I, hallelujah, the Bible says that now faith, now faith, hallelujah. Come on, I want you to activate the now faith. That I'm not going to believe God to when I see it, but I believe God for now. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. I'm recharging my hope. Somebody in here has lost their hope. They, they, they don't believe that God can do it again. They're struggling with their faith. But hallelujah, faith is success of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah, God wants you to activate your now faith. Hallelujah, there's a place where, let me tell you something. That, I've never been in this place of trust. I've never been in this place where I trusted what God said about me. 
And some of us have heard so many times through our childhood that you were not good enough or you didn't come from the family lineage that said that I'm good enough. You didn't, you lost hope because not for me. I believe, has anybody like that? They pray for other people and believe for other people, but not for me. But God wants you to activate that now faith today. Believe God. What do you have to lose? Believe God. Try it out. Try this thing out. Let me tell you something. You, it's like having a membership to the Y. And not going. Paying is being automatically deducted out of your account monthly. I'm preaching to somebody in here. Am I in somebody's business? Planet Fitness, whatever y'all got down here. I got both of them. Pray for me. But I started, but one thing I started doing something different. I started to activate my account. I started activating my account. Now I started off with once a week. I was activating it. I started going twice a week. I was activating it. I started going three times a week. I was doing good. You can tell me nothing. You know? And so, you know, I I, I, yeah, I began to walk and use what I was paying for. Now, for you, it was free. Faith ain't costing you nothing. Nothing. Jesus already took care of everything. It's clean. And sometimes we feel unti entitled that we just like, oh, it's nothing. But he paid a cost for us to have the access that we have. And God wants you to walk in it. And so if you're going to become the man or woman of God that he has called you to be, challenge you to walk in your faith. And I don't know if we do all, we do all calls. I want to have a moment that we come to this altar. If you, that is you. You feel like this message, you found yourself in the word of God today. You found yourself in this place where I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling to believe what God has said about me. I'm struggling to believe this place I'm in. I don't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. God wants to help you make sense of it all. And sometimes it won't make sense to you, but you have to trust him. You have to trust him. It was four and a half years ago that I had what I would call a beautiful, beautiful family. We had the boy and the girl. We were workers in the church. And I, I was married and, you know, our relationship was great. We were ministering to other couples and sharing um, our story and, and really reviving a lot of relationships. But suddenly, my husband died. Suddenly, my husband died, and I was devastated, devastated, first of all, because it looked nothing like the plans that I thought God had for me, nothing like it. So the first two years, I, have, I would say I was like Stephan, I was full of faith, full of faith, I believed, I said, oh, God about to show out in this situation. And I was jokingly said, I said, oh, I'm about to travel over the world telling my story. I'm going to write books. And then come two years later, I was still dealing with the weight of grief. And it's okay. Because I was going through my journey of becoming. So two years afterwards in the third year, I started to ask a question. God, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? This doesn't feel right. Because after a certain time, I, I, I felt, you know, time goes on. Get over it. Move on. But the truth is, I was still hurting. I was still in a place where I was struggling. With, I began, struggle, began to struggle with my faith in God. And so it wasn't until probably within a year ago, I'm being, being honest and being vulnerable, a year ago that I had to repent because I was blaming God for what took place in my life. I was going to church, and I was arriving at church and worshiping because I truly loved God. I really loved him, but I was hurt by God. Anybody ever been there? I loved God, but I was hurt by God. So it was causing this almost like a uh, water hose tight. And so there was a little seep of flow with my connection with God, but it wasn't full, fully connection because this place was, this thing was blocking it. 
So I want, I want to tell you that it wasn't until I had an intimate encounter with God and I shared with him where I was and where I was struggling my faith and I repented for blaming God for my, my walk, blaming God for where he was taking me, that I began to experience the flow of God. And so some of you guys had that issue that really the disconnect that you're having with the flow and, and becoming who you need to be, becoming who God wants you to be, is because there's a disconnect between you and God. And so if that's you, I wanna, we're going to open the altar for the ministers to pray with you. And so that you can have that place and be in full of faith. Amen. Amen. I, I will be what you call me to be. I say yes, Lord, I agree, my desire, passionately is to be what you call me to be, that's what I'll be. My desire. If you haven't come to this altar, I want you to lift up your hands and just say yes. Be what you call me to be. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Lord, I agree what you say about me. Lord, I agree my desire. That's what I'll be. That's what I'll be. 